<laughs> Welcome to the Bible Made Clear. Uh, today we have uh, a discussion or interview, uh, whatever you choose. Uh, I have Herb Butterworth again, a good friend and um, uh, good Christian support, uh, fellow worker in the gospel. And um, so where I had been going through a series on Calvinism, asking the question whether it was orthodox or not, um, I know Herb has been uh, with me during that series. And uh, so... Uh, we had decided to have a conversation because there's so much to be said um, along the lines of um, Calvinism and how it affects Christianity and all that. Uh, at the same time, it's very difficult to get all the issues in on a presentation, um, especially as you're flipping through kind of a PowerPoint uh, presentation because you have to really kind of spell it out, it becomes difficult. So we figured we'd have a conversation. And if you guys can benefit from that, that's great. Um, and certainly if you have any questions, uh, though this isn't live and this is going to be put up as a recording, uh, you can always uh, send an email to uh, BibleMadeClear at gmail.com. And if it's a question for Herb, I'll forward it to Herb. Uh, he can answer you. If it's a question for me, I'll try to answer the best that I can. So uh, welcome, Herb, uh, from all the, way, you. all the way up there in uh, uh, the far north, yes. far north, almost to Canada. But um, yeah. so, Herb, let me just ask you, and why don't we begin by you telling me your thoughts as um, as you've kind of watched the uh, the presentations and uh, and by the way, um, I have an addendum that I'm putting on to it. So even though uh, number six said final, there's going to be a few more because I'm kind of getting um, uh, pressured by people uh, from the perspective that they feel as though I didn't adequately, and, and these are mostly Calvinists, that didn't adequately answer uh, some of the uh, Calvinistic viewpoints properly or to their liking anyways. And so I'm trying to expand on it a little bit more and maybe bring about some other uh, topics. But um, anyways, up until this point, because um, those haven't aired yet, um, w what are your thoughts? My thoughts are that you, um, I think that you define Calvinism for what it is. I, I, I don't see anything that... Uh, would be controversial to any Calvinist. I think you're just putting it out there as it truly is. I don't think you've re misrepresented it at all, as, as you've been accused of by some. But um, my thought is that uh, I think that some people, when it's put into simple language and just put right out there, I think they're uncomfortable with it, and rightfully so. They should be. I think it's a... Uh, it's just theology that just does not hold up to the Gospels. I think you um, did a great job in presenting it, and uh, you know it's uh, it's it was a great presentation, and a needed presentation. Well, so um, aside from that, g give me your thoughts uh, on Calvinism. What is what is your personal perspective? Well, my personal perspective is that if a person is to read the Bible in its entirety, I don't think that anybody on their own, just reading the gospel, would, um, would have any, any um, idea that God chose just a few without any, any um, reason for doing it. He just... Uh, he just randomly chooses people for salvation and that others, he just, um, he lets them go to eternal damnation for no other reason than just that they were not selected. Nobody would come up with that. That's a, uh, that's a man made, I'm going to say philosophy. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that you can do that without somebody putting a bug in your ear. And if you start listening to men, I think there's a problem. So, Would you agree with that? Yeah. So you've 
you've actually, we've had a lot of these conversations, and you've actually defined it as coaching. Uh, I like that term because... Well, that's uh, what it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't think that you can, I agree, I don't think that you can just open up the Bible, read it, and that it makes sense in any normal fashion, um, as far as Calvinism is concerned, without actually coaching somebody. That's what you're saying, correct? That's correct. That's correct. It's not, it's not a natural flow to read the scriptures and come away thinking, oh, well, God has already chosen his elect, and there's nothing that anybody can do about that. We're just writing it out. There's no... And, and to me, I, if I... Thinking like that, I would come away thinking, well, there's really no purpose in any of this. It's already been determined. We're either saved or we're not. There's nothing that we can do about it. And I think that's a, a, a falsehood. I don't think that's truth. So how would you, how would you answer um, Calvinists' viewpoint on God's sovereignty? Give me your thoughts on that. Well, God is sovereign. There's no question about that. But in his sovereignty, he's, he has allowed us to have um, free will. We can either choose him or not. He presents us with, um, with his creation, and he presents us with his word. And we see his creation, and he speaks to us through it, and he speaks to us through his word, and we see that creation and the word are coherent. They, they go together as one. And he tells us in his word that he loves every one of us and, and desires for fellowship with every one of us. And he gives every one of us a way to be forgiven for our, our sinful nature, which we all have. And I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a realistic or a, a valid point of view to say that he's already selected just a few or whatever the number may be, and and they don't they don't even have a choice in the matter. They've been elected, and that's all there is to it. And the rest of us are are damned. And I think that's absurd. I think that's a uh, it's a disservice to to God's nature. It does not present Him as He is. So. <clears throat> Calvinists see sovereignty as the necessity of God controlling everything. So they would equate his ability to um, be absolutely sovereign with his um, absolute control. Now, fr from their perspective, within their framework, uh, I understand how that all makes sense. Um, I think that, I mean, I... I believe the Bible tells us, like you do, um, that God is sovereign, right? In the psalm, he says that he, he sits in the heavens and he does whatsoever he pleases. I mean, um, God is sovereign. But I think that that has to be taken in comparison to the other attributes of God. In other words, um, God is, look, he created everything. He created the universe. So obviously... He's all powerful. Um, there's nothing that he doesn't know. He's all knowing. Um, he's everywhere present. Uh, there's no place that people can escape from him. Uh, the scriptures make all that abundantly clear. Now, now the mere fact that he is working everything to the end that's written in the Bible um, to his pleasure and according to his plan. In other words, his plan is going to be fulfilled. What's prophesied has been fulfilled already. What's prophesied and has not been fulfilled is yet to come. So since, um, since that has already been established and God is going to bring the end of the plan according to his liking, he's obviously sovereign uh, in that he can do that. Yet at the same time, um, he provides man free will in order to make the decisions that they do. Now, I don't know how God, um, you know, with the billions of people on the planet and in history, 
providing them free will, can control everything and work everything the way that he does. I mean, I think it's my own belief is it's similar to um, what happened with Joseph, right? Um, he said to his brothers down in Egypt, he said, you know, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, you know, uh, God, God can take the wicked things that people do, but he can somehow utilize that to accomplish his end goals um, without violating people's free will. And so um, I think we see that in the crucifixion. Obviously, God uh, had a plan um, from eternity to sacrifice his son because of his love for us. Yet at the same time, um, you know, he didn't make, um, you know, Judas betray him. Uh, he didn't make the particular people that tortured and crucified him. He didn't make them do that. Um, the people that were involved were involved. That's just a, a matter of course. But his, his determining something does not mean um, that he is removing people's free will. Now, I don't, I don't exactly know how that, that works. I'm not God. Um, <coughs> however, at the same time, I think that um, to, for, for me to determine that no, God cannot be sovereign unless he makes and controls everything like a bunch of puppets. Um, I think that that is, I think that's actually diminishing his ability. And it is, um, it is putting God into a category where he does not have the capability that the Bible lays out. Because look, he's all powerful, but he's not going to make a rock too big for him to lift because that would be in violation of his own nature. And it's not logical. Everything that God has done um, is logical and it works um, within our reason. In other words, if we can't understand anything, if there's no such thing as logic and reason, if, as you've brought up in the past, then why do we even have it? And how do we even know what we're thinking, believing or following even in reference to God would be true? We wouldn't know that. I mean, we're made in the image of God, so we have to have that ability to reason the way God has created us and have also the freedom to make choices the way God's created us. Otherwise, what kind of image is that that we are image bearers of, right? It's it's something that's not even real. You want to respond to that? I, I think that when you, when you bring up the point of logic and reason, I think that we can look at... Uh, how God created us, and he created us in his image. Part of that image is that he, he gave us his ability to use reason and to use logic, and I think that we're required to use that when we read his word. And when we read his word and apply the logic that he gave us, I, I think that uh, we come away realizing that he loves us all and that he sent his son to die on that cross for all of us, every last one of us, that all we have to do is, is just believe and, and to, to fall in love with Jesus. And, and that's all it takes. And anything other than that is, I think it violates logic. And, and reason. And to say that he predestined a few before creation even began, I, I think it, it makes a mockery of his word. And, and it's just, it's, to me, it's just very untrue. How they, you know, they can't even explain the things that they claim as, as far as a double predestination, that he, he created some to save and others to damnation. And, and they have no ability to get away from that. Um, the people that are the elect are the elect or, or come to believe only because he intervened on their behalf and gave them the means to, um, to see his truth and come and worship him. And, uh, 
you know, we were talking earlier, and I, I made the point of if you you um, have a judge and he's overseeing a murder trial, and there's two men that are accused of murder, and they're both found guilty, and they're equally guilty. They're both just as guilty as one another, and the judge says, all right, well, you, we're going to put you in prison for the rest of your life, but you, the other guy, we're going to let you go scot-free. Now, would anybody say that that was justice? Was any, would anybody say, oh, isn't that judge kind and compassionate because he let one go? No, they're going to scream injustice. And that's a logical conclusion. That is injustice. And as far as, uh, you know, when Calvinists claim that the elect are saved through the mercy of God and his goodness, well, that's great for them. But what about the others? See, the minute he intervenes and saves one, but not the other, that becomes illogical. That lacks justice. If he were to say that all men are guilty, all men have sinned, all fall short, short of the glory of God, which they have, he's perfectly within his right, and it would be perfect, ju perfectly justified to say all humankind is sent to damnation. There's nothing wrong with that. He would have every right to say that. But he gives us all an equal opportunity to call out to him, to see his word, to have salvation. Jesus died for all, that whoever should believe will be saved. But the moment that he just takes one and not the other, that becomes illogical and unjustified. That's not good. In other words, I'll put it like this. If there was a house burning down and there were, say, 10 people in it, and I had the ability to go in and take every one of them out, but I decided, no, I'm just going to save five. So I went in and I, I carried five of them out, and the other five, I could have gone back and got them, but no, nah, I don't want to do that. Would you come to me after after I had done that and say, oh, Herb, you're so, you're so good and kind and compassionate because you took those five out? No. You wouldn't say that. You'd say, what's wrong with you? You let five people burn to death inside that house that you could have saved. Is that is that true? Well, what's what's interesting from a Calvinist perspective, they would say that um, uh, the other people deserve to burn. And so they they received it justifiably, yeah, which yeah. is which is kind of crazy. And somehow that glorifies God that he sends people to hell. Um, but from my perspective on that, you have these. These 10 people, I don't know any of them. I know nothing about any of them. But I just decide the first five I come across, I'll save them. The next five, no, I'm just not going to. Yeah, I could, but I'm not going to. Right. In other That's words, the you, way. yeah, you're, you're making an, what you're saying is, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make an arbitrary choice regarding. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And that's what they're saying, because they say that in no way is he doing it He's not saving people or electing people in any foreknowledge that he has. Nothing good that they're going to do in the future or anything like that. He's just, you know, I, I, I imagine there'll be some Calvinists out there that will say, no, you're misrepresenting Calvinism. You're not understanding Calvinism. That's to the best of my knowledge. What they're saying is there's no foreknowledge involved in this at all. Nothing from the future. Nothing that any person can do or has done or will do. He's just arbitrarily selecting his elect. Well, based on nothing. And and to add to that, it's not just that there's an arbitrary selection, but the only way somebody can come to Christ as a Calvinist is through God's intervening. So um, he intervenes to rescue a few, and then he sends the rest of uh, mankind to damnation, as you say. But the problem is, is that not only in the selection process, right, which is what what you're emphasizing, but the other problem is, is that because, according to Calvinism, people can't exercise their own faith to be saved, that even if um, if people do get saved, it's only because God brings them to that point. So if he has the if, if the only way, in other words, it would be different if 
uh, if as we teach the Bible, I think clearly represents that God gives the presentation to all and then all have the opportunity to say yes or no. I mean, that's up to them. In other words, you know, I had the, you know, the one response on the, um, the YouTube video saying, so you're, you're saying man is the final arbiter in, in the decision of salvation. Well, you can define it the way you'd like to, but if, you're, if the real question is, am I saying that man ultimately makes the choice? Yes, because God does all the work. God's grace offers salvation. Uh, that's how it has come to us. Uh, Christ made the, um, the sacrifice that provided the way for all to be saved. Uh, obviously, all are not going to be saved. We know that at this point, and, and you can see that through history. However, if, if from a free will perspective, people don't get saved, well, that's not God's fault. God has done everything to, to provide the redemption, to clear the path, to bring them to conviction, to tell them the truth of the gospel, the power of the word of God. In other words, all these forces working to bring them to a place of faith. But in order for it to be actual and real in a relationship, then the person must respond. Now, I don't believe that the Bible teaches that uh, the exercise of my own personal faith is works. Um, many Calvinists would say that it is. Uh, I think Paul d distinguishes between works and faith. Uh, I went through that uh you know, to a measure in the presentations. But um, my point is, is that you're making, you're, you're emphasizing the selection process um, for rescuing people, but that's only half of the story. The other half of the story is, is that if, if like you said, you, you had the ability to save everybody or rescue everybody in the burning house, and you just decided not to for whatever reasons you have, but that will determine in measure your character. In other words, th there must be some reason why you decided not to rescue everybody that you could, because the only way they could be rescued is if you went in to get them. They couldn't rescue themselves. And so Calvinists are saying in the fact that you had the ability to rescue everybody from the house, the, though we don't know what your selection process was because it had nothing to do with the people, the only way they could get out of the house is if you went and, you know, carried them all out, which you had the ability to do, but you let some burn and somehow you're looked at as a hero because you, you know, it, it makes you look good if you let some burn somehow. But, um, but the, you know, the, the comparison within Calvinism is not just that God is selecting some, but in the selection process, he has to irresistibly make them believe. So the other people don't even have the, like, there's no option. The option's removed. It would be like if you said uh, to the people in the house that was burning, um, hey, if you, if you want me to rescue you, you know, just put up your hand and I'll carry you out. Now, if, if only half the people put up their hand, well, you've done, you know, you did all the work. Um, it was just a matter of them saying, yeah, I'll go for that, right? And and then you and carried... Do we, say, do we say that they saved themselves because they put up their hand? No, they, they, rescued them? No, they still have no ability. In other words, they don't have no. the ability to save themselves, but they do have the ability to respond. See, that's the differentiation. Calvinists would say they can't even put their hand up. We would say that... The gospel goes out and people can put their hand up and say, I want to be saved. They can't save themselves, right? But they can respond. The Calvinists are saying they can't respond. They're saying even with the conviction of the Holy Spirit, right, in the gospel of John, uh, the, you know, Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come and convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Uh, that's three things that the Holy Spirit is bearing down on people. And as you say, you know, we know God through general revelation, right? Romans 1, that the creation exists and he has put it in people so they have no excuse if they, they
They don't recognize that he's there. And secondly, in chapter two, it talks about conscience. So God is working on my conscience. Well, obviously, he, he writes the, the truth on my heart through my conscience. Uh, certainly has to be refined through the word of God. But without the word of God, I have a general knowledge of right and wrong, which is why Jesus even said to uh, some of the parents, he says, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, right? Uh, he said, you're, you're evil, you know, you got to send nature, you can be wicked, but uh, you know how to do good. Like, you know how to perform a good act. In other, in other words, in order for that to be, and in order for him to be able to communicate that to them, they had to understand in their mind, their conscience, the difference between moral right and moral wrong, right? So pe people are not, um, you know, like Andy Woods has said, dead stones that can't respond to anything. Um, the people have a conscience. Um, they are, they are by nature, sinners separated from God, that's spiritual death to be separated from God. But that doesn't mean that they have an inability to respond. And I think what Calvinists do is they take total depravity to the point where they, they overemphasize it and they drive it uh, to its uh, extreme that the Bible doesn't and say that, no, a person that is spiritually dead is like a physically dead person, which the two are not equal because even in Scripture they're not equal. A, a spiritually dead person is still walking around making decisions. They can respond to God like Adam, Balaam, and other people. Um, God talks to people that are spiritually dead. Cornelius was spiritually dead until Peter brought the gospel to him, but yet he was seeking God. Uh, Paul um, uh, on Mars Hill, uh, he said, you know, uh, God has commanded every man, you know, he winked at sin or overlooked it in the past to a measure, but now he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Well, uh, yeah. that means everybody. That just doesn't mean a, that he's not just talking about the elect. He's talking about everybody. So um, so when we when we say that um, total depravity, the T in the tulip uh, acrostic, it means total inability, like a person cannot respond then what we're doing is we're making spiritual death equal physical death, which it doesn't even equal in the Bible, um, because people can respond to God. The, the Calvinist is saying that man cannot respond in any way. They have no ability to even know that God is there or to respond. And if that's the case, then... What God is doing is he is telling us through the whole of Scripture how we need to be like him, that we need to be just, we need to be equitable, um, we need to not have respect of persons or partiality in dealing with people, but yet he does. So um, th there's a problem. So if I, if I have to look at Calvinism and if I have to say, okay, so... Um, in order for me to um, be like God, does that mean that I have to be arbitrary in my care and love for people? Um, do I only treat some people if I find out they're the elect, uh, they're better than others? I mean, th this throws the Bible into confusion because the Bible is presenting God as being his nature, being the very basis of. Um, He's the foundation of, you know, morality, moral goodness. He's the foundation of my understanding of love and righteousness and justice and everything. And so if if he exercises that in an arbitrary way, why is he telling me not to? In other words, that doesn't make any sense. But yet the Calvinistic system. Um, and again, if their view on total depravity is correct, that that it it you know, people are dead as a stone and they can't respond to anything. Well, that would be right. But I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. The Bible does not uh, present that, which means that um, man can respond. He can respond to God because it's God, the Holy Spirit, that's doing the convicting work. I mean, we had we've had some of this conversation before, but you, you know what I'm saying on this, right? I know exactly what you're saying. We'll go back to uh Romans 1, and Paul 
says that uh, God has revealed himself through nature. And who hasn't gone out at night and looked up at the sky and just wondered, you know, just be in awe of what they're seeing out there? I mean, that's, you know, God declares his glory through nature. Now, Paul goes on to say that this leaves none of us with any excuse. We, we, we have no excuse. Now, if the Calvinistic system was true, I would say, Paul, what are you talking about no excuse? These poor people weren't plugged in. They, they don't know. They haven't been given the keys, so to speak. They, they, they can't know. There's no way that they can know. So Paul is in the wrong in saying that. And as we talked about earlier, Jesus is, when he said, Oh, Israel, how I've longed to take you under my wings like a, like a hen takes in its chicks, but you would not listen. Well, I'd have to say, Jesus, he didn't give them the ability. They, they have no way of, of knowing the truth. You have five TV sets and you plug two of them in and they're working fine. The other three aren't working because you never bothered to plug them in. You don't say, you stupid, bad TVs, you're not working properly the way that I, I want you to. So we're going to throw you into the trash. Well, that's irrational. That's, that's nonsense. And, and that's the Calvinistic view. It really is. It's that simple. Now, of course, they would say, no, you're misrepresenting Calvinism. No. That's not misrepresenting Calvinism at all. That's what it is. You have people that have been given this knowledge and others that haven't. It's totally unfair. It's unjust. And that's not the God of the Bible. That's distorting his nature. What the Bible screams to us is that he loves us all. He gives us all equal opportunity. He presents us with the same information. We can respond or not. And if they say that responding to him is work, that's that's just not so. And I think Andy Wood put it well. He's, I think it was, he said, if um, you go around offering people $10 bills and some people take it and some people don't, and, and he's saying that if somebody takes the $10 bill and they reach up and they take the $10 bill from you, are you going to say that they work for it? No, because faith is a passive act. It's a very simple thing. God has done all the work for us. All we have to do is accept. And as you one time said, you, you put it in, in another way, it was a wages versus gift. Wages is something that you work for. You earn it. You do something for a, for a fee. A gift is something that somebody gives you. And if you reach out and accept the gift, just put your hands out and you place the gift in their hands, are you going to say that they worked for it? It's totally distorted. God is sovereign in what he does. He offers a gift. We can freely take it or freely reject it. And that's all there is to it. It's quite simple. And I'd like to take this opportunity. I was just recently given a book by a, a brother that I go to church with, Dr. Thomas J. Gaffney. And he wrote a book. It's called A Prophecy of Love. God's Design for Loving Relationships. And this has nothing to do with Calvinism. He didn't have anything like that on his mind when he wrote that. He's just a man who loves the Lord, and he wrote this book about relationships. He's a uh, psychologist, and he just wrote this little piece in here, and it jumped out at me. I just recently read this. And what he says, and I'll read you the quote. I don't want to paraphrase. He says, with his desire for loving, God created the angels and humankind with free will. After all, wouldn't love be shallow without it? What satisfaction could there be in loving that is totally controlled? It would be nothing more than phony love of self. Can you imagine God using his infinite power to direct all his creation to worship him on cue. It's absurd. And I thought, wow, that says it all right there. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. And I don't see how anybody could not. It's absurd. What yeah. they're suggesting, suggesting is absolutely absurd. Well, and I think we both agree on that. Um, let, let's, um, let's walk through real quickly the, the tulip, um, in case anybody is unclear 
uh, of what that actually means. So the T, from a Calvinistic perspective, the T is total depravity and the uh, which, which to them means total inability. I know they're going to say that that's not what it means, but um, the, the easiest way to understand uh, Calvinist view <clears throat> of total depravity is uh, to use your example with the, uh, you know, handing somebody 10 bucks. Um, they have to take their hand and then put the money in it and then close the fingers and take it. So the person, right. you know, it's like the person's crippled. They don't even know that they're grabbing it because because the, the person giving them the money is grabbing it for them. And that's what I meant when I said that uh, God is believing for the person, which they disagree with. But uh, I don't know how they get around it. Uh, it. You know, in the end, either the person's own faith is exercised or God is causing them to exercise faith which means it's God doing the work, right? Um, or God doing the action, let me say it that way, all right? Um, there's, th there's no way that if God makes them exercise faith by giving them faith as a gift, then it's God giving them the gift of faith, and otherwise they can't do it. So it's God doing it. It's God believing on their behalf. I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know how you get around that. I mean, it's either or. It can't be both. So um, so in, in that sense, the T is total depravity, but they mean total inability. Man does not have the ability to even receive the $10. They, they, even if they had their hand out, they can't close their hand. Somebody has to put the money in their hand, close their hand, and I, don't, I guess that's when, you know, but the person doesn't even know that it's being done, right? So right. so they must have to, you know, turn their head to make them see it or whatever. So, in other words, God is controlling the situation so much so because man has no freedom that it's not man doing it. It's God. It's God all the way. And so they see that as um as total depravity now because a person has no ability they have to be unconditionally elected that's the you um, they can't be elected based on any other criteria it can't be based on their faith uh, it can't be you know as we've talked there's really only three views of election it's either unconditional where god makes all the uh, decisions without condition um, or it's God you know sees that a person has faith uh, or there's corporate election where God chooses those that are in Christ so if you exercise faith and you're in Christ then you become one of the elect right just like um, your identification and everything you have is in Christ my forgiveness is in Christ my redemption is in Christ. My position before God is in Christ. My justification. My eternity is in Christ. My, um, I'm, I'm an heir um, of what I'm going to receive uh, only because I'm in Christ. In other words, everything is in Christ. There's nothing outside of Christ, including my status as being elect because he's the elect one. And so now I am elect in Christ, right? Um, so whatever one you choose, the bottom line is for a Calvinist, they can only choose unconditional election um, in the form that they need it. In other words, <clears throat> it can't be unconditional election from the standpoint of uh, many evangelicals believe that, well, God makes his choice, people freely make theirs, and we just don't know how that works. And I understand that. I, I don't really have too much of an issue with that. But the Calvinist says no. God makes his choice. Man makes no choice because man is totally depraved, meaning he has no ability. So after he unconditionally elects them, then he only atones. That's the L, right? T-U-L for limited atonement. He only atones for those ones that he chose because if he atones for anybody else, then they get saved. In other words, they see it as uh, if they're atoned for, then their sins are paid for. So then it identifies them as the elect. Because if I, if, if, 
you know, if Jesus pays for your sins, your sins are paid for, so you're not going to be judged for them, so you, you're going to heaven, so you must be one of the elect. So, so it, can't, it can't extend beyond the elect. If it does, then now you have non-elect people um, having their sins atoned for, and so they won't account for them themselves, which to Calvinists doesn't make sense, at least within the tulip acrostic and their logical presentation. Now, if, if Jesus has only atoned for this limited few, how does he get them to believe? Well, he does it irresistibly. His grace irresistibly brings them to a place where he gives them life, he regenerates them. Now that they have spiritual life, because they were dead as a rock, now they can actually exercise their faith in Christ. Now they can believe. They couldn't believe before. They can only believe now. Well, how do they believe? Oh, well, God gives them not only spiritual life, regeneration, but he then gives them the gift of faith because they can't exercise faith on their own. Even as a person that's alive, they can't exercise faith on their own. They have to have that gift of faith in order to believe. And if they are the elect that have been atoned for, that have been made irresistibly to believe, and again, it would have to be against their will, because otherwise their will would be to believe, um, then he makes sure that they persevere um, to the end. And the only way that people know that they are one of the elect is if they're persevering. Now, I know that <clears throat> among Calvinists, there are varying views by Calvinist leaders on what good works should look like in order to know and be secured that you're one of the elect, which kind of starts to push um, my security as persevering into a mentality of works, which can kind of wreak havoc in the Christian life because it's not by grace anymore. It's really, well, I know I'm elect because I'm doing good works, but then the question is, Am I just doing the works because I want to be one of the elect or am I actually an elect and God's making me do the good works? Because again, even sanctification is not by choice. It is God determining that they will be sanctified and grow in maturity. But then the question is, well, who's evaluating whether it's a valid maturity or am I maturing quick enough? If I'm maturing too slow, does that mean I'm not elect? And again, not to get off into it, but this is where John MacArthur and the Lordship Salvation and, you know, you got to be um, have all this criteria fulfilled in order to be saved, which is really a false gospel. But um, another topic for another time. But but that that's kind of their system. Now, a Calvinist doesn't actually know that they're saved until the end and they stand before God. I mean, the Making Bible. Sure that yeah, the Bible teaches, I mean, John said in 1 John 3, he says, Beloved, now are we the children of God, right? Now. He, he, he was giving them the assurance. Uh, we have the assurance in this life, right? John, um, you know, uh, 3, 24, right? We've passed from death into life because of our faith. Um, uh, you know, I, I know that I'm saved because of the promise of God, um, not because I'm measuring my salvation based on my good deeds to demonstrate my electness. Do, does that make sense? Yeah, well, I want to. I want to uh, really get some things clear here. And one of the things the Calvinists will say is that God does not send anybody to hell. They're in their own sin, and they send themselves there in their sin. I want to make it clear, I understand what they're saying, that these people may be in their own sin, and absolutely some of them do. But to say that they send themselves there, it, under the Calvinistic view, that's really unfair, because they have no other choice. They were created for that. Now, again, I, I, I do not have any intention of misrepresenting what they're saying. But what they're saying is that, that they're sending themselves there, but they have no other, no other means. They have no means to, to get out of that. 
that's what they've been predestined for, double predestination. Now, the man who was saved, he has been regenerated. So he, and they'll say, well, no, it's a real faith. You know, you 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 say that they've been made robots, that they've been reprogrammed, they've been regenerated, so that they see God as He is. They see Him as the 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 loving Father that He is, who has rescued them. And yes, they they do. I have no doubt about that. But it's not fair, because they've been given something that the others haven't. And the only reason that they see Him and love Him and worship Him is because they have been reprogrammed to be able to do that, and the others haven't been. So it's really not justice, and you really can't say, oh, no, these people are sending themselves there. They're really not. I mean, yes, it's their sin. They live in that sin, but they have no choice. They, they can't get out of it because they have not been given the key. They have not been reprogrammed. Is that incorrect? Is that unfair to say? I, of course, I think that they would say, yes, I'm, I'm misunderstanding it. I just don't get it. But I don't see it that way. Well, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, as we walk through this, um, let's refer back to um, what the Bible says. So in Acts 13, Paul preached the gospel to Jews and they didn't want what he was presenting. And he said that, okay, um, since you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, um, you know, I'll preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then it says the Gentiles heard him gladly. Um, it was uh, Acts 13, 48. Um, some translations have the word uh, appointed some ordained or whatever it says uh, and those gentiles that were appointed to eternal life believed um, but it's really not um, you know calvinists make a big thing out of it so so you no, know, they were see they they're all predestined and and that's not what luke is even saying um, if you read all the grammarians first of all uh, appointed is in the middle tense, which means it's something they do to themselves. They didn't appoint themselves to eternal life if, if uh, like, they didn't predestine themselves. Um, Luke is just distinguishing between the Jews that looked at themselves, and Paul says, fine, so you, you view yourselves unworthy of eternal life? That's fine. In other words, that's your decision, right? He didn't say, well, apparently God didn't elect you. It's getting like that right th th there's no reference to that 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 even that concept anywhere and the distinguishing fact in the verses is that you have jews that rejected gentiles that were all excited because they were receptive to the gospel and then um they were lined up essentially the the word appointed means to you know to present or whatever and they were essentially they were lined up on god's side and they were excited about it the jews rejected and that was their own fault um kind of similar to um in acts 28 right when paul was again he got brought to rome um called for the jews after he got settled uh was sharing the gospel with a whole bunch of them he it says he he tried to persuade them all day long um and you know, there was some uh, debate, obviously, among them. And at the end of the day, he said, you know, uh, well, has Isaiah the prophet spoken of you saying, you know, and seeing you won't see and hearing you won't hear. And he says, you know, you've closed your your own eyes. In other words, it's something that they did. Uh, and he says, I'm just going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, kind of same message. And um, those none of those. None of those conversations, none of what Paul is saying makes any sense in a Calvinistic framework. In other words, well, most of the Bible doesn't make any sense in a Calvinistic framework because they have to add words in that are not there to make it fit their theology. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling Calvinists a cult, but they think cultically um, the Jehovah Witnesses do that because Jesus is not, um, he is not 
uh, equal in in um, in the same God as God the Father and the Holy Spirit. They see him as Michael the Archangel, uh, you know, Jehovah's first created being, and all this. So, um, you know, when they translate John one one, they say, "In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was," and they add in a God, right? Because they can't make him the same as, um, you know, same essence uh, with God the Father. And, you know, in Colossians 1, um, it says that Jesus created every other thing, right? So they add the word other in it. He didn't create everything. He created every other thing because he's a creation. So when you start adding words in to make your theology work, well, not only does that corrupt the word of God, but it it misrepresents what the what the Bible is saying, which also uh, misrepresents God Himself because God's word is being distorted, uh, and it sends a message that is simply not true. Now the cults do that, and the the thing that removes, for example, Jehovah Witnesses, and and in the beginning of the the series, I, I established what the essentials of Christianity are. And I think that was important because people throw around the term heresy and heretic and cults and all this stuff. Oh, you're, you know, somebody doesn't agree with somebody. It's, oh, you're a heretic. Well, you know, let's, let's make the words mean something. And so if we understand the essentials of Christianity and we line up the Jehovah Witnesses against the essentials, we have to say, well, they're a cult. Uh, they teach their their foundational theology is heretical in other words they are they are wrong from the start they don't even have the right god because they don't have a god that is the biblical god with the trinity uh you know jesus is not one with the father uh so you know he's he's his name is jesus but he's got a different address okay he's michael the archangel so he's an entirely different being that cannot redeem anybody OK, so Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not even a player in Christianity. Now, the difference with Calvinism is, is that Calvinism would adhere to all the essentials. However, in their teaching of other aspects of how God operates and what the Bible says, they have become unbiblical. Many aspects of Calvinism is really heretical. The only thing that keeps Calvinism, and I know this is a strong statement, but it's the reality of it. The only thing that keeps Calvinism inside the the framework of orthodoxy is that they maintain the essentials. However, they they live on the edge because, because in the process of them coming in within the boundaries of orthodoxy, um, how they teach that orthodoxy, much of it is heretical because they're, they're teaching something that's not true and they're trying to make the Bible say something that it's not saying. It does not say that man is dead as a rock spiritually. It does not say that, um, you know, Jesus only atoned for a certain number of people. It does not say that Man cannot exercise his own faith, and he has to be irresistibly made to believe uh, against his will. Now, obviously, everybody in irresistible grace that's made to believe is against their will, because otherwise they, their will would be to believe, right? So that means God has to force every elect person in Calvinism against their will to believe, and then he makes sure that they get to heaven because... He makes sure that they persevere to the end, and then they find that out on the day of judgment, I guess, because they can't be really reassured of it now, because uh, maybe if they have sin in their life, they backslide. Like John MacArthur teaches that, um, um, that you know, we don't have a sin nature anymore. Well, good luck with that. Not only does the Bible teach differently, especially Paul in Romans 7, but if we didn't have a sin nature, we wouldn't be sinning, you know. Um, again, they have fancy ways of getting all around it that, you know, um, you know, you just have, you know, you're, you're, you're just used to doing sinful practices. So you got to kind of stop doing them, but it's like, well, wait a minute, if I don't have a sin nature, 
then I'm not even going to desire to sin. So I want, why would I be sinning? Um, and why would the Bible say, you know, um, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness. If I have, even if, if you could make me right now without a sin nature and I sinned in, a, in another minute, I'd then have a sin nature, like I'd get it back. I mean, this stuff is crazy. It, it just, it, it doesn't make it. I almost can't believe we're talking about it because the Bible well, is so, I know. The, the Bible's just so foreign to it, Herb. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I think this I, is what, I, I this is what confuses Christians. And this is what the problem is. It, and it is a problem. And Calvinism is just, it's simply not good. And I'll use the term exegesis, meaning that you read the Bible and let it speak to you. What they're doing is eisegesis. They're putting things in that aren't there. Now, what's interesting is R.C. Sproul, one of the probably most famous uh, Calvinists there was. He's no longer with us. And he's not a Calvinist anymore, by the way. And um, he was talking about his conversion to Calvinism. And he read the Bible like we all do. And he's a man that, that loved the Lord. I have no doubt about that. And he was saved. But... He was talking about that, and when somebody introduced the idea of Calvinism to him, he rejected it. It just totally, it, it was foreign to him. He didn't, he couldn't accept that. And then he got a coach, got some good coaching, and I guess someone was pointing out certain parts of Scripture to him, certain verses or whatever, and he said after a while, he just could not deny that what, the Calvinist coach was teaching him was true. And I think that's a shame. Um, he, he, somebody else other than scripture, it was a man, convinced him that this was true. And I think that's the problem with Calvinism. Now, Calvinism as a group, to me, it's just absolutely absurd. I, I cannot accept it. I just, like you said, I can't believe we even have to discuss this. But I'll tell you, Scott, I, I look at it in this way. I have gone to art museums before, and I'm not an art critic. I don't, I, I, you know, I like a good landscape painting and much as anybody else, but I look at some of the things that they call masterpieces and they look absolutely ridiculous to me, but they're held in very high regard. And I can see, you know, people there at the art show and they're probably clinking their champagne glasses and they're all getting it. And they're all saying, oh my, that's really jumps out at me. Oh, it speaks to me. I, I think that those people, my own self, I think that they're full of it. I think I, I think it's a ridiculous drawing. It looks like a three-year-old did it, and they're all saying how wonderful it is. But I think they're just kind of buying into it. They don't want to be the one that doesn't get it, you know? And so uh, you're saying they don't want to be the non-elite? They don't want to be the non-elite, and they don't want to be the non-elect. So... They get into the club, and I, I view Calvinism, and I hope, well, it probably does. It's going to offend people, but I think that they're kind of a country club, and they're clinking their champagne glasses and saying, oh, you just don't get it. You don't understand. You're not elect. You haven't been enlightened in this. I think that's a bunch of nonsense. It's just the Bible does not tell us that. A plain and simple reading of the Bible tells us that God loves every single one of us and desires fellowship with every single one of us, and it pains him that any of us would slip away. And he's done everything in his power to make it possible for us to come with him. And what greater love than Jesus Christ on the cross? He showed that to all of us, and he did that for every one of us that whoever should believe would be saved. It's that simple. It's a gift, and all we have to do is reach out and touch, take it, and he's done all of the work. All we have to do is accept it. And if you want to call that work, call it work. If, it, if you think that that interferes with God's sovereignty, you're foolish. God is completely sovereign, and he loves us all, and he desires fellowship with us all. And I think that anything that distorts that or takes away from that is a distortion of his nature. And what do we say about things that take your eyes off of Jesus for who he is and what he's done for us? What do we say about that? It's anti-Christian, for one thing. To put it nicely, that's anti-Christian. 
But we could go so far as to say that's somewhat satanic. And I'm not saying that they're, you know, a satanic cult. I'm not suggesting that, but it does his work. It takes us off our eyes off of who he is and what he's done for us. And furthermore, as I often have said to you, it makes a mockery of creation. All the pain and human suffering that we've seen over the past 6,000 years is for nothing. He's already determined everything. We have nothing to say about it. We have no choice in the matter. It's all been laid out, and it's for nothing. People suffering every single day, children starving to death every single day, and it's for nothing. We have no choice in the matter. We can't reach out through all of this, all of this suffering that we see, that God changes in the end, and he'll make it all for good. Calvinists is kind of denying that. It's already been determined. So all this suffering is needless. And I'd go so far as to say that through the Calvinist perspective, Christ on the cross is meaningless because he just programs you. He makes you able to see his truth and his love, and there was no necessity for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a mockery of the gospel. And I stand by that, and I am totally opposed to Calvinistic views I won't accept it. <clears throat> well, and I, yes, and I, I think one of the things that you said, Herb, which is so true, is the Bible is simple. I think that certainly there are, there are more, um, there were more difficult things. Um, I like what Norman Geisler used to say when he get into some of the uh, more difficult theological topics as you start to drill down. He said, now, you know, now we're going to go into the deep end of the pool. OK. Um, and but but Christianity is the shallow end. Um, sure, there are you know, you get into aspects of eschatology, um, you know, study of last things. You get into studies of uh, different aspects of um, some theological issues, even within the Bible that can be a bit complicated or. Um, require something, let's say they require something more than just a surface reading. Um, you know, they require enough study where you're digging into grammar and other things. Um, but look, um, you know, m my mother, she came to Christ in her 60s and she died when she was 88, went to be with the Lord. Um, she was not, I mean, I think she only went to the seventh or eighth grade. She was not um, you know, uh, well-educated. Okay. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't stupid. Uh, she could read, she could read well, she probably read better than me, but, um, but she just, you know, she just didn't have a huge broad knowledge of a lot of things. You know, she was born in 1920. So, um, but she clearly got the gospel and she clearly got what the new Testament said. Um, you know, she used uh, some Bible commentaries I got for her that, you know, she really liked J. Vernon McGee and others. And uh, because uh, they did actually kind of put the cookies on the shelf where you can reach them. Um, and it made some of the more difficult parts of the Bible uh, more easily accessible. But, um, you know, but but the Bible, for the most part, it gave her everything that she needed for all the practical wisdom and decisions and applications she had to make in life for the, you know, 25 years, the last 25 years of her life that she was a Christian. And um, and God, like, really worked through her in a lot of ways. So um, so it like th there wasn't this um, elitist knowledge that she needed in order to have God working in her her life the way that he did and, and really speaking to her on things that, you know, it was confirmed that he was um, helping with along the way. But um, but to have this idea, uh, like you say, nobody's going to just like, like my mother was not going to read the Bible and come away and say, oh, well, it looks like we're so depraved that uh, we can't make any decisions and God has to give us the gift of faith and you know, I mean, she would never go down that road. There would be no need for it because the, a natural reading of the Bible is is that uh, people need to make a choice. 
People need to decide whether they're going to exercise faith in Christ or they're not going to. I mean, it's really that simple. And um, the Bible gives us all the different nuances of how God reaches people because he loves them. Um, you know, he has different ways of um, trying to communicate the truth to people uh, based on where they're at. Because he is interested in reaching everybody, uh, regardless of their um, level of sophistication or their educational status or whatever, which is really more of a modern thing because, um, you know, as we've talked about, education over the over the centuries has really grown and developed so that, um, you know, it's really all the educated people that created the institutions that decided that kind of what's acceptable, but that's all at a horizontal level. That has nothing to do with ultimate truth in our relation to God. Um, that's just kind of how we got to function uh, within the areas of life down here. But um, but the, the, the goal is, is to keep the Bible as simple as possible. And where there are more complicated things... Um, to try to keep them simple. And if somebody wants to dig in, you know, if my mother came to me and said, hey, um, you know, uh, I want you to explain to me better, you know, the um, the hypostatic union of Christ, <laughs> you know, and all this, I would have said, wow, uh, sure, let's dig into that. But uh, she didn't need to understand all that stuff in order to be saved and to grow as a Christian. Uh, she... You know, she just wanted to understand the Bible the best that she could and um, and worship and love God because uh, she appreciated all that Christ did for us. So, I mean, it was it was simple. Right. Um, I think that if we have to take a Christian, uh, which Calvinists have to do and then say, OK, I know that you were taught this, but let me show you what the Bible actually teaches and then kind of lay Calvinism over the Bible and say, see, you didn't really make the decision to get saved. God gave you the gift of faith. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't have got saved. You couldn't have exercised any faith. Oh, I couldn't have. No, you didn't respond on your own. God made you to respond because you were the only one that he atoned for. He didn't atone for the other people. You're one of the select group. And uh, he'll make sure that you persevere to the end. Oh, how do I know that I'm an elect? Oh, well, you'll do good works. Uh, so make sure you maintain good works. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be one of the elect. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Am I elect because I do good works? Do I do good works because I'm elect? You have to tell me to do that. Why don't I just do them if God's making me do them? In other words, none of this stuff makes any sense. Like you say, it's all coaching. And I think that it does a disservice to people because there's many within the Calvinistic camp that struggle because they know they have a sin nature they know that they are struggling with certain sins that they would never relate to any of their friends or people they go to church with because they know that that, that alone may disqualify them as being one of the elect. Because in many Calvinistic circles, um, they don't believe that people have a sin nature and why are you struggling with those sins you should be moving on you know if you were really one of the elect you wouldn't have these problems and and it just becomes this idealistic falsely sanitized version of christianity where people are dying on the inside and just presenting on the outside instead of actually just being real christians and yeah uh, christians sometimes can do some pretty sinful things uh, I'm certainly not advocating it. I'm just saying the reality is, is that people um, are not going to get rid of their sin natures until they get their glorified bodies. Uh, that's clear. And from the standpoint of trying to minister to people, um, wh why would any Christian have to be told anything? Like, why would we have to listen to any of the Calvinist elites? I mean, God is going to make sure that we are sanctified and he's going to make sure this all happens. So why, well, like, why do we need them? Should just occur, right? I mean, um, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is, none of the framework makes any sense. It doesn't. Um, it does not correlate with the Bible or with actual reality, and it just creates this artificial, um, almost like a Disney version of of Christianity 
um, that that has all its like redefinitions of words. You know what I mean? Uh, Calvinists I have, they, they've redefined uh, almost everything that that the Bible makes clear to their own liking, and so that it fits their framework. Yeah, and like you said, you know that the. the, the the essential things of being a Christian are very clear in the Bible. You can read the Bible and like, you, you know, there's things that you might have trouble with that you don't understand, but the essential things are clear and anybody can read them and understand them. Now there are some things that are deeper, like you say, revelation can get kind of heavy at times, but those are things that you can come to understand. You, you use uh, different commentaries and, you go to Bible studies and, you know, they're talked about and discussed and you get a clearer picture. Now, that's not the same as accepting Calvinism. When you go to a Bible study and things that aren't clear to you, you have little understanding of. When they're presented, when they're taught in a commentary or a Bible study, you don't just go there and just listen to what the pastor says and just accept it. You use your own logic, your God-given logic that's a gift that he gave us to apply to his word. And when you do that, it becomes clear. And you say, well, that's logical. That makes sense to me. Now I understand that. When I apply that to Calvinism, no, that doesn't work. It's, it's unreasonable. It just doesn't work out. I don't see that in light of Scripture. That doesn't make sense to me. And I think you really have to... Uh, you have to stretch things out a bit. You have to, you have to want to believe it. You have to want to be a member of the club. <laughs> if you're, uh, if, if there's just no reason to to accept it, I don't. I don't understand. I don't understand why it's even in existence. I, I throw my hands up in frustration. I, I don't know. Well, I don't know it what it's all about. Yeah, it really goes back to Augustine, and you know. Um, well, yeah. I think that, um, I mean, Augustine was a Manichaean Gnostic. He got saved. He was not uh, a theological determinist. In other words, he didn't think that God determined everything good and bad. However, um, in his debates with uh, Pelagius, a guy that, you know, didn't believe people had a sin nature, could make their own choice, which unfortunately Calvinists, uh, blame everybody that's not a Calvinist to be either a semi or full Pelagian, which is just a misnomer. MacArthur does it all the time. It's just so frustrating because, uh, again, they, they're just operating from their own um, framework. And so everything outside of Calvinism is just automatically wrong by default. But be that as it may, um, you know, uh, Augustine got back into some of his um, Gnostic concepts and and then Calvin picked up on that and just basically uh, probably not only regurgitated it but developed it even a little bit more in certain areas and um, and the problem with this is is that quite frankly I think that Calvinism presents God more in a paganistic fashion than a biblical fashion and again I know that's a strong statement but um, Calvinism does not represent God the way that the Bible does, which means they are misrepresenting him uh, and they are redefining um, different aspects. I mean, look, you, you simply can't read that, you know, um, Jesus died for all, that God loves all, and then just say, well, you got to add all the elect, just the elect. I mean, if you have to keep adding words in there, doesn't that tell you that there's something wrong? I mean, well, no, I mean, really. Is all. What's that? In the, in the words of Norman Geisler, all means all, and that's all that all means. Right. And they would change that. Oh, no, all means the elect, just the elect. No, all means all. I, I, you want to redefine what all means, you know, have at it, but I'm not buying into it. I know. I mean, you know, First uh, Timothy 2, God would have all men saved. Well, that doesn't mean that all men are going to be saved, but God would like to have all men saved, right? Um, so uh, that that's expressing God's desire. Now, because God, again, if we were to just take that verse within a Calvinistic framework, they would say, well, see, 
nothing can violate God's will. And so um, if God wanted all people saved, they'd all be saved. And it's like, no, no, no. It's because God gives free will to those that are made in his image and the angels, obviously, that sinned. Um, people can make their own decision. And though God wants all to be saved, all are not going to be saved. I mean, otherwise... Well, they, you know, another thing, it's just... I, if, if we're all totally depraved, none of us have any ability to come to the Lord. None of us have any desire to come to the Lord because we're all totally depraved. Yet God reaches out to the elect and calls them in and gives them the ability, reprograms them, gives them the ability to see his love and to love him in return. But he only does that for a few. Why is that? Why wouldn't he just reach out and take them all in? Just like, you know, the, the burning house scenario I gave you. And and I question, well, why wouldn't, if, if no one is better than another, it's not based on works or anything anybody has ever done, but he just chooses some of them and not all. I, the only logical conclusion I could come to is that God's not powerful enough to save all. He can just, he has enough strength just for a few. Or is the real estate in heaven just limited and there's not enough room for everybody? That's yeah. the only logical conclusion I can come to. And of course, that's absurd. Well, that's I think ridiculous. I think the Calvinists would say that, um, well, he doesn't want to save everybody. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, especially the consistent Calvinist would say, well, if God wanted to save everybody, then he would save everybody, but he doesn't want to save everybody. He only wants to save the elect because that's the only way that their system can work. It, it just can't be any other way. Now, it's irrational. Now, oh, I know that. And the Bible doesn't teach that. They have to they have to come to that conclusion and then they have to take that schematic and place it over the Bible. And that's how it works. It doesn't work apart from their predetermination to the, to lay those presuppositions over the Bible. You Like you said earlier with uh, exegesis and eisegesis, if the Bible is just speaking, it doesn't tell us that. We have to tell the Bible that it says right. that in order for it to actually tell us that. So we're saying, this is what you need to tell me. We're imposing Calvinism on the Bible so the Bible can <clears throat> then tell us what we have determined that it's going to tell us. I mean, it, obviously, it's a dangerous way to to um, to read the scriptures and to have a relationship with God because it distorts the whole thing. Um, I mean, look, we, I mean, we should probably continue it at another time. We're about almost an hour and 20 minutes, but um, but I, I think that, it, look, uh, I'm glad that I got your thoughts on it. And, you know, if if people can benefit from listening to us, that's great. Um, but I think, on, um, unfortunately, this this is going to continue to be an issue that divides people. Um, I think that people that are not Calvinists are very willing to work with Calvinists. I think Calvinists are more reluctant to work with other believers um, you know, I, I look personally, I, I don't care whether you're Calvinist, Arminian or anything in between, as long as you're saved. And I think that we should all work together to get the gospel out. Um, and I think that that's, that's what would please God. Um, because the, the goal is to get as many out of the house as possible. I think that's God's goal. And the fact that he asked people who wants to get out of the burning house um, certainly is not, they're not working their way to get out. They're just saying, you know, <laughs> I'm up for not burning, right? Um, so then somebody's going to carry them out. So Christ carries them out of the burning house. But, um, but, you know, you can go in and you can share that message, whether you're a Calvinist or a Minist or anything in between. Um, and 
<clears throat> and so we should be able to work together on that, or at least, at least try to. Um, I don't think that we yeah, should. Uh, we shouldn't be at we, we shouldn't be at odds that the but the fundamental problem is is that um people that are not calvinists want to reach as many people and even if that's in a group like we see in the bible in both the gospels and the book of acts preaching to groups um but calvinists are not up for that because they're afraid you may preach the gospel to somebody that's not one of the elect and they could be deceived into thinking that they could be saved when they can't be, uh, which, frankly, I don't know why they care because it's just going to kind of fall out the way that God's determined anyways. What's the difference? Yeah, nothing matters. You know, you might as well all just stay home. Well, no, but I mean, golf. I mean, I, I don't know why Calvinists reject the idea of preaching to groups. They say, well, you shouldn't be offering the gospel to people that can't be saved. What's the difference? What's the difference yep. whether they think they're saved or they don't think they're saved? If they're not going to heaven and if they can't go to heaven and if they're not elected, what's the difference? Really? Well, you're right. Yeah. But the important thing is, as you pointed out, I think that uh, we, we, we do need to work together because there are far more pressing issues in our society today, which is obvious. And I think we need... To, to work together, and my beef with them is that they're distorting the, the uh, image of God, His nature, and um, it, it's it's teaching people a false God. He's not the way that they present Him. He loves everyone, and He desires fellowship with everyone, and I don't appreciate them telling people that that's not how He is, and that's my issue. Well, we can end on that, I suppose. Um, All right. So, um, Anyways, uh, as we kind of bring this to a close, uh, we can certainly pick it up with Herb um, uh, in another in another time. But um, like I said, if you have any questions um, and you want them directed towards me or to Herb, you can just send an email to BibleMadeClear at gmail.com. Uh, we will do our best to answer your questions hopefully to your satisfaction uh, we can't always do that but um, uh, until next time uh, until our next recording next week uh, may god richly bless you as you continue to study his word <laughs>